continue to bring us folks who are desperate to know the God of the Bible that they can be related to in saving faith and uh, roll up their sleeves in gospel enterprise. Uh, thank you for the privilege. Keep us alert and awake to what your spirit is teaching us about the greatness of our God. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. We are continuing tonight. Uh, we began looking at God's attributes last week, uh, his perfections. These are some more of God's non-communicable attributes, things that he holds to himself, things that his followers do not emulate. Uh, we got into his omnipresence last week. God is everywhere. And so we want to uh, begin tonight looking at another non-communicable attribute, that of his omniscience. Jerry Bridges said God never has to agonize over a decision. He does not even have to deliberate within himself or consult others outside of himself. His wisdom is intuitive, infinitive, and infallible. His understanding has no limit. In Psalm 147, in verse number 5, Great is our God and abundant in power. His discernment is infinite. So let's take our, our definition here and take it apart, and then put it back together. By definition, when we talk about God's omniscience, God is infinite in knowledge. He knows himself and all other things perfectly from all eternity, and whether they are actual or merely possible, whether they be past, present, or future. To say that is to say that God knows himself perfectly. Run over to 1 Corinthians 2 for a moment. And as you're turning to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, let's think about prescriptions to illustrate this. Now, I don't know if it was a week, a week ago or two weeks ago, I was getting a prescription filled for a family member, and it looked like both prescriptions were the exact same drug, except for the pharmacist recognized there were two letters. Uh, E-R, I think, extended relief. And it made a world of difference as to which one. So think about how many times that you may have failed to rigor rigorously check your prescription since many times uh, doctors or pharmacists aren't seeing all the other stuff that you're on. How many other everyday aspects of life can quickly go awry from one simple mistake or oversight, uh, a host of things. Life can be very frightening until you grasp that God is not like your well-intentioned pharmacist. With him, never a mix-up. He's never confused. Isn't that great when we work with mortal man who messes up constantly, and yet we've got a God with which there are no mix-ups? Uh, we're going to go to Isaiah 40 uh, from that statement in just a moment, but uh, we just mentioned 1 Corinthians 2. Notice verses 10 and 11. But to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the depths of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the depths of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. So as we talk about God's omniscience. God knows everything, and we're starting off with that he knows himself perfectly. Only the Spirit of God can teach us about the God of Scripture. Now, take your Bibles, run back to Isaiah the prophet real quick. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. And since we are going to Isaiah 40, this will be uh, um, a reminder that a lot of the rhetorical questions in Scripture 
what is a rhetorical question? It's a question that doesn't really need an answer. It's patently obvious to the casual observer. So this is one of many rhetorical questions in Scripture that both convicts and schools us in our weakness and his power. Isaiah 40, notice verse 13. Who has encompassed the spirit of Yahweh or as his counselor has informed him? Well, that's a question that doesn't need an answer. Nobody has been God's counselor. Verse 14, with whom did he take counsel or who gave him understanding and who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge? Because God's knowledge is infinite and perfect, God never needs to learn anything. You know, when we talk about prayer, we've mentioned recently that when we pray, we're not praying for God's benefit. We're not telling him anything he doesn't know. Prayer is more for our benefit as we're conforming our wills to his. We don't tell God anything. A.W. Tozer in The Knowledge of the Holy, short little paperback that packs a punch. He said, wisdom, among other things, is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. It sees the end from the beginning, so there can be no need to guess or conjecture. Wisdom sees everything in focus, each in proper relation to all, and is thus able to work toward predestined goals with flawless precision. I'm going to come back there in just a moment. He says, all God's acts are done in perfect wisdom, first for his own glory and then for his highest good of the greatest number for the longest time. And all his actions are as pure as they are wise and as good as they are wise and pure. Not only could his acts not be better done, a better way to do them could not be imagined. Now, from our perspective, from man's perspective, we can come along and think that, hey, this is the way we ought to go about something. And if we were just a bit higher, like from God's vantage point, and I know this probably won't illustrate it well, but uh, uh, as Jim and I were up on uh, the mountain today cutting, what what did we get, 30, 40 trees or so? And uh, I only had a couple of hangers that got hung up. And if I had just seen from a different angle that if you dropped this smaller tree, this other tree would not have gotten hung up there. If I had from God's perspective, ah, of course if you cut that one, it's going to land into that one. God doesn't need to be schooled on anything. His knowledge is infinite. Knows himself, all other things perfectly from all eternity, whether they be actual or merely possible, whether they be past, present, or future. He knows himself perfectly. Let's give another bullet point here. God knows all things actually existing perfectly. For instance, inanimate creation. I'm going from Isaiah back to Psalm, Psalm 47, verse 4 and 5. Psalm 147, verse number four. Who counts the number of the stars? He gives names to all of them. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His discernment is infinite. So this is literally true. That God counts the number of stars and gives names to them all. Now, suppose it's not literal. Maybe God didn't literally number and name them all. Even if he didn't number and name them all, this is specific language used in Scripture as God condescends to communicate. We said last week or the week before, we couldn't know anything about God unless he was kind enough to reveal it to us. And so he speaks in concepts and ways that we can understand. Yeah, I think it's 
literal, that he counted the stars, names them all. But even if it's not literal, it's pointing to a literal aspect that every single detail he has knowledge of. You know, our puny brains couldn't comprehend it unless he condescended and speaks in these kind of terms. Like, uh, like when we were talking about the saint of God being under the shelter of God's wings. God's a, God doesn't have a body of flesh like we do. He doesn't have wings, but it's conveying a, a concept that we wouldn't understand otherwise. God knows all things actually existing perfectly. Case point number two, brute creation. In Matthew 10, Matthew 10, 29 and 30. Are not two sparrows sold for an asarion? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now let's slip on our first century sandals for just a moment. Sparrows. Trash birds, the lowest of the realm of birds. You can get two of them for a bargain price. And yet Jesus is teaching not one of the cheapest birds ever falls to the ground without your Heavenly Father knowing. And by the way, He doesn't just know the birds that fall from the sky. He knows the hairs that fall from your head. That's pretty incredible that he knows all the details of our life. Nothing escapes his attention. Uh, another, another gospel reference is uh, Luke twelve seven, when he does say that the very hairs of your head are numbered. So he knows how many hairs we have and he knows how many that we've lost. Even when people try to obscure their sin, the brilliant light of God's omniscience exposes it. That we do so before the all-seeing, all-knowing God. He's the ultimate accountability partner. So as we're trying to live a life above board in sincerity and honesty and be men and women of integrity, because what we do in private, and, and we're doing before the all-knowing God. You see the practical benefit of a study like we're doing on Wednesday nights, growing in our view of God so that it even helps us in our sanctification. In prayer, we live with a God consciousness. Perhaps the most astounding thing about this attribute is that though he knows every detail of our lives, that he still loves us. You ever have those thoughts of if, if our friends really knew the real me, they wouldn't like the real me, and yet God knows the real me and still set his love upon me. You know, see Hosea 2, 19 and 20. He knew Israel's sin. He knew all, all about our sin and yet sent his son to die on our behalf. So it's futile to be a hypocrite. There's no place you can hide from God's presence that we looked at last week or his knowledge that we're looking into this week. Futile. Man can only see the exterior front. God looks upon our hearts. Even those who try to hide behind church affiliation, baptism, adherence to rules, or morality, all is laid bare and exposed before our all-knowing or omniscient God. This is the God who will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. So God knows all things actually existing perfectly. Inanimate creation, brute creation. Uh, oh, I guess I, I don't need to advance the slide yet. Men and their works. Uh, Psalm 33 Psalm 33, verse number 13. Yahweh looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he gazes 
on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who forms the heart of them all, he who understands all their works. You know, think of how comforting to those over in Ukraine right now who are being bombed. You know, my uh, missionary friend Greg White just posted this morning that there are five Christian men that were in a bomb shelter taking out food and clothing and necessities that were killed, leaving five widows and kids. The uh, psalm I was reading this morning, it's like God knows perfectly what to do in ushering his beloved ones into his presence for eternity, knowing exactly how he's going to care for the fatherless and the widow. He's going to do it abundantly, like he always does. And so when they're there where there's many places in Mirapol, there's no power, there's no propane, there's no food, and you're wondering, does anybody see what's going on as we're being obliterated? Yeah, God sees, God knows. Not a single sparrow falls without his notice, and not a hair from our head falls without his notice. He knows men and their works. Whenever alone. Men's thoughts and hearts. Psalm 139. Uh, now, in Psalm 139, all three omnis, God's omnipresence, his omniscience, his all, uh, and his uh, omnipotence, his great power. All three are found in Psalm 139. And yet, Psalm 139 is not just to teach theology of the greatness of God, but this personal aspect. Psalm 139. O Yahweh, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. Now understand Hebrew parallelism. The understanding is everywhere in between two. Not just when I sit and when I rise. Not just when I leave my home and come home again. Everything, everywhere in between. So you know when I sit down, when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path, my lying down, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. <laughs> you know, we think that we know so much, and he knows our hearts better than we do, our thoughts better than we do. Even before there is a word on my tongue, the psalmist says, Behold, O Yahweh, you know it all. God knows all things actually existing perfectly. This is a perfect knowledge. God knows all things possible. Now we're... In our little Bible study, we're running back to the New Testament. We're keeping both uh, a foot in each testament tonight. Matthew 11, 21. Matthew eleven twenty one. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus is saying that authoritatively with exhaustive knowledge that all the miracles, the healings, the deeds of his power that he displayed, and he said, if I'd done it there, they would have already repented. Verse 22, nevertheless, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the day of Sodom and the day of judgment than for you. So we're saying God knows all things that are possible. Not just things that actually exist. Does he have a perfect knowledge of the first bullet point on the slide? but what is possible. Only what is in God's plan is possible because only that could become reality in time. Why am I belaboring the point? 
because we would reject all forms of middle knowledge, whether the classic Molinist concept or the so-called compatibilistic reformulation. God knows every possibility because the only thing that is actually remotely possible is what he will bring to pass. Okay, so possibilities, he knows. Future, he knows. In Isaiah 40, 44, verse 28 through 45, 1. We won't turn there right now due to time's sake, but here you've got a prophecy given a century and a half before Cyrus lived and became king of Persia. Isaiah 46, 9. Uh, let me throw in another one. Uh, this would, uh, would be a reference you'd need to jot down. Sunday, as we were looking at the great tribulation and the abomination of desolation, this is Daniel's 70th week in Daniel 9. One of Hundreds of scriptures. Even where Messiah was going to be born, they knew years before. What was prophesied in Bethlehem? God knows the future. So, here, here's a question we need to ask. Since we're saying that God has exhaustive knowledge of possibilities, and of the future, what do we do with the texts of Scripture that depict God as being ignorant of some matter? How do they jive? How do they connect? Back in Deuteronomy 8, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. And then we're going to go to the first book. Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you should remember all the way which Yahweh your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you'd keep his commandments or not. Did the children of Israel have to go for 40 years around the backside of the desert for God to figure out what was in their heart? Not at all. Okay, so go back to Genesis 22. Let's use Abraham. This is a classic example. In Genesis 22, remember what God told Abraham, that you're going to go sacrifice your only son, you know, that son of promise. <laughs> Give up the promise, right? Genesis 22. So he, he does everything in detail that God told him to do. He's about to slaughter his son like God told him to, verse 12. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the boy and do nothing to him for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only one, from me. Did God have to wait for dagger to be drawn to know what was in Abraham's heart? Not at all. Another question. How much does God really know? Well, Gregory Boyd in the camp of open theism says so the verse clearly says that it was because Abraham did what he did that the Lord knew he was a faithful covenant partner. This verse has no clear meaning if God was certain that Abraham would fear him before he offered up his son. I'd say, Dr. Boyd, you're a brilliant guy. You just, you're wrong. If God must test Abraham to find out what is in his heart, it is present knowledge, not future knowledge, that God doesn't have. 
recently we'd uh, made a passing reference in regards to trials that God does not question if the faith he gives will fail, but he proves that through saving faith, it can't fail. God doesn't have to figure it out. He doesn't have to wait for us to do things, to choose things before he can know that it's going to come to pass. So again, that question, how much does God really know? For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. All is all that all means. God already had confidence in Abraham's faith. In fact, the faith of Abraham before and after the test in Genesis 22 is outlined specifically in Hebrews 11. Before I give you the verses, what's the significance of Hebrews 11? What's in Hebrews 11? Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Fame of Faith. Patriarch after patriarch, saint after saint in the Old Testament. And he gets towards the end of his chapter and he said, time doesn't allow me to go on with all these other ones to give you these several verses outlining faith. So, how much does God really know? Just because God knows in advance what would happen does not mean that God should not express appropriate reactions when it actually happens. Actually, the test was a majestic confirmation of Abraham's confidence in God. Abraham thus becomes a magnificent example of faith for every believer of every generation. According to what Paul writes to the saints at Rome in Romans 16, 27, he is the only wise God. His perfect knowledge results in perfect wisdom. His wisdom is omniscience acting along with his holy will. Yet the world of unredeemed men views the wisdom of God as foolishness. Yet it gives us confidence amidst difficulty as believers. Comfort for every situation that He hasn't forgotten me. He knows all who belong to Him for He put their names in the book of life before the world began. Ephesians 1.4 When did your name go down in the Lamb's book of life? Back then. Not when you repented and believed. Waiting to see if you're finally actually going to choose God. No, God chose you. Just a little more application. I, I trust that you understand the frailty, dear friend, of your wisdom. Our wisdom is post-fall. Genesis 3, sin affects everything. When you choose what you can figure out and what makes sense to you, though contrary to God's wisdom revealed in Scripture, you're doomed to fail. When we're found to respond wrongly to difficulty, not trusting, but anxious, we are only paying lip service to this doctrine without applying it to our life situations. And since we are talking about God's exhaustive knowledge, God's knowledge that isn't just an awareness, but a guarantee to bring to fulfillment what he knows is going to happen, we must connect his foreknowledge for just a second. We can try not to step up on a soapbox here and spend the rest of our teaching time. From the history of the Greek verb prognosko, his foreknowledge, the word behind the New Testament concept of God's foreknowledge and the biblical evidence of God's omniscience, theologians extend the concept of foreknowledge to cover his intimate and intentional knowledge of all things before they become actual in time and space. Again, going back to when God chose us. He did not look down through the cores of time to see who would choose him, and he dubs them his elect ones. 
You know, as proof of this more general foreknowledge, we could point to predictive prophecy like we've already done in the previous slide. All these prophecies that were given before they actually became reality. And we'll spend time in the, with Isaiah in Isaiah 41, 42, 43, 44. When it's used to depict God's foreknowledge, that verb prognosco and the noun prognosis are used of God's perfectly purposed relational knowledge of everyone who is in his redemptive plan before they exist in time and space. And I wish I had had time and, and forethought to get my Spurgeon quote together that it's a good thing he chose me before I was because he definitely wouldn't choose me now. God's foreknowledge is not passive. It's not dependent on foresight of what humans would do. It is eternally purposed by God. Paul asserted that God foreknew only those whom he also predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Romans 8, 29 and 30. I think it's a shame that we quote Romans 8, 28. We know that God works all things together for good to them that love him without remembering what comes after, that God's not just working the good for good, but if it's some bad stuff that's going to produce Christ-likeness in me, verse 29, He's going to work that into my life too. Whatever it takes to make us like Jesus. He's predestined, He's called, He's justified and glorified. From beginning to the very culmination and final, final, finality of our glorified state. All the way, He assures, from beginning to end. Is that not comforting to know He doesn't lose a one? Well, we must move on to at least one more attribute. We got, into, got two attributes in last week. We'll get two in this week. God is not just... Omnipresent last week and omniscient, he is omnipotent. He has the ability and power to do anything. You remember, what was it, two weeks ago we looked at the names of God. To look at the names of God is to also understand some of the attributes, the perfections of God. Because his name many times conveys. So El Shaddai, the Almighty, speaks of the awesome strength and might of our God. If it's a matter of power, behold, his is the strong one. Job 9.19 9, We've been to Isaiah tonight. we got to get there for another couple of verses. And as you go back to Isaiah 40, let me repeat myself and remind you that when your spectacles of faith need cleaning with the greatness of God, you go to Job 38 to 42 where God schools Job in his own greatness. You go to Isaiah 40 through 48, which are pregnant passages putting God up in blazing splendor. As we affirm our weakness, we also affirm His power because we are inadequate and He is all adequate. Isaiah 40, look at verse 15. Isaiah 40, 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are counted as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the coastlands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as non-existent and utterly formless. 
Think about how this truth bolsters believers over in Ukraine. As you've got this tyrant ramrodding over into Ukraine with all of his power, and yet they're just a drop in the bucket. When God exercises his power, he does so effortlessly. Now, I, I came to Bible study and prayer meeting tonight kind of tired. Uh, uh, physical exercise cleans my clock. When God expends effort, he isn't spent in one single bit. That is so far past our experience. It's no more difficult for God to create a universe than to make a butterfly. A.W. W. Tozer said, Since he has at his command all the power in the universe, the Lord God omnipotent can do anything as easy as anything else. All his acts are done without effort. He expends no energy that must be replenished. His self-sufficiency makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. All the power required to do all that he wills to do lies in undiminished fullness in his own infinite being, unquote. And yet if we don't get to bed and recharge our cells and replenish the dead cells in our bodies, we come up lacking the next day. He is omnipotent. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. So we've got unsearchable understanding and a non-wearying power. God's power is infinite. He doesn't become weary or tired. Rather than question what he does, we need to understand he can do anything he wants. He does not ask for our approval. Who is the sovereign? He is. We are not. Who are you who answers back to God? Will the thing molded say to the molder, why'd you make me like this? Does the potter have a right over the clay? Remember that this God who is all powerful is also all good. And if you've sat around with me for any length of time in biblical counseling, you know that I, I love affirming the absolute sovereignty of God. But what good is a sovereign God if he's like the gods of Roman, mythology, Roman Greek mythology who were malicious towards men. He is not just all powerful, but he is all good. And as we talked about last week, he is present in the perfection of all of his attributes. He is all holy while he is all love. And while he is all powerful, he is also all ever presently good. Let's think of about a, a, a few expressions of his power. There's three we want to think about, and then we'll conclude. First one would be creation. God spoke everything into being. We got to work everything into being. You know, I know uh, uh, some guys I was talking with this week are, are working on building their wood shop. And when I was a teenager and used to work with wood, it took a lot of hard work to make a desk or a bookcase. And God can speak into existence. No one helped the Lord create the world. By himself, he spoke it into existence. That Isaiah reference, Isaiah 44, 22, 24. He wielded in creation, calling into being that which does not exist. This is God creating ex nihilo out of nothing. He spoke it into being. Hebrews 1, 3 speaks about his sustaining power. If God should snooze one single moment, everything goes, uh, goes haywire. 
and yet he sustains everything from the word of his power. What he created, he sustains, he maintains, and he preserves. That Greek word uphold means to support or maintain. This present activity is more than a law of nature, but the very activity of God. Isn't it great? We don't have to wonder about a nuclear meltdown, nor whether it will blow up or even be depleting the ozone layer to die by. And we, especially since we haven't found any uh, life on another planet, we just await his appointed time for it all to burn up by divine plan revealed in Scripture. So he spoke it all into being, he sustains it all. Think about the sun. 12,000 degrees. If closer, we'd burn. If further away, we'd freeze. And God got it right at the right spot. The earth, tilted on an exact angle of 23 degrees, enabled us to have four seasons out here. If you lived in New England, where I'm from, you got five. It's called, the fifth one's called mud season. Can't get around. You know, if the, if the earth was, was not tilted, vapors from the ocean would move south and north, creating enormous ice continents. If the atmosphere suddenly thinned out, meteors that presently burn up would constantly hit us. If the moon didn't re remain a specific distance from the earth, the ocean tide would completely inundate the land twice a day. What's the lesson from creation, his creative power? That things don't just happen in our universe. Actually, it's not ours. It's his universe. He sustains and is the principal agent of cohesion. Not some watchmaker who just kind of flung the earth and lets it tend to itself. Set in motion. Hasn't bothered with it ever since the beginning. He's the reason the universe is a cosmos rather than chaos. I like how Dr. MacArthur put it in his uh, book on the majesty of God he makes a good point. He said, God didn't literally rest on the seventh day, but simply finished his work. If God had rested one moment, everything he had made would have fallen apart because he is the sustainer of his creation. You want another expression of his power? How about, uh, my clicky's not working. Is it? There we go. Salvation. From the beginning of salvation to the conclusion. What's Philippians 1.6? If you, if you have not memorized this, this is your scripture memory verse this week. And your pastor, who has quoted this more times than he cares to think of, all of a sudden uh, can't do so. So I guess it's time for me to bone up on, on my own scripture. Uh, uh, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work and you will be faithful to form it until the day of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad he didn't just get things started for us and leave it to us to finish it out? Jude 24 and 25, oftentimes in high church services, is a benediction. As you commit God's people to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. It's not just a benediction, but a theological realization of his power. Power in creation, power in salvation. An even greater display of creation is this of salvation where God takes those who are dead men and makes them alive. Somebody asked me this, this last week, well, you're a cessationist. You don't believe the sign gifts are for today, but for a previous day. You're, you're right. Um, so uh, let me remember where I was going with this uh, illustration. Um, so does God do miracles? Well, yeah, he's doing it every time. Somebody's born again of the Spirit of God. When we celebrate 
somebody following the Lord in obedience in the waters of baptism, it is a miracle service celebrating from death to life everlasting. So God would take those who to the world are foolish, frail, weaklings, fishermen, the most unlikely candidates to advance Jesus' ministry that he started on earth. And you get to the book of Acts and they turn the world upside down. The powerful one carries all repentant sinners from justification to glorification without losing one single one. F.B. Meyer wrote in his epistle to the, or, or his commentary of Philippians, we go into the artist's studio, we find there unfinished pictures covering large canvases and suggesting great designs, but which have been left either because the genius was not competent to complete the work or because paralysis laid the hand low in death. But as we go into God's great workshop, we find nothing that bears the mark of haste or insufficiency of power to finish, and we are sure that the work which he has gra his grace has begun, the arm of his strength, will complete. Now, I'm no artist, but I could take you to my bench and my garage, and there's plenty of unfinished projects that have not uh, come to culmination. That's not our God, who from beginning to end powerfully finishes it. And one final expression of power how about the resurrection? That Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, faced the cross because of the Father's power and his own. He himself had power to conquer death. Now, we haven't visited with John yet today, have we? John 10, marvelous words from our master's lips. In John 10, Jesus says, verse 17, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. Now, oftentimes we look from man's perspective of the Romans who actually crucified Jesus. We look at the Jews, the religious up muckety mucks who didn't like Jesus, and so they orchestrated it all. And when the soldier, the centurion, came to break the legs of Jesus, what happened? He didn't need to hasten Jesus' death like he did the others because Jesus had already laid his life down in his time that he might take it up again. He says in verse 18, No one takes it away from me, but from myself I lay it down. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again, this command I received. From my father so much power that he'll raise from the dead not only himself but all who have ever lived both the righteous and unrighteous the unrighteous will be resurrected to damnation and the righteous unto eternal life shoot we're out of time man I didn't realize uh, I'd gone overboard I almost apologize. Pray with me, would you? Father, so much more to be said about your exhaustive wisdom, your limitless power. Help us to consider as we go home this evening what that does for our worship, what that does for our confidence, what that does for our hope, what that does for our victory. And there's only one proper response of our humility. Thank you for your greatness to embrace that in all of our weakness. We cautious to give you all the praise and for your sake. Amen.